on a windy, wet Saturday in Syracuse, New York. The hopes and dreams of a scrappy and determined West Virginia football team became reality. The Peach Bowl Team Selection Committee is unanimous in extending a bid to West Virginia University to play my bowl classic. Congratulations. As he accepted the bid on behalf of the players he had led to an 8-3 record, Don Nealon could not have been happier. At least, not until they flexed their muscles for a national television audience and flounced Florida 26-6 on New Year's Eve. It was a fitting way to cap the beginning of a new era in Mountaineer football. You see, the winning is just beginning at West Virginia. The first four games of the 1981 season were critical to the postseason plans that had been mapped by Mountaineer followers everywhere. West Virginia opened at Virginia, then traveled up the coast to Maryland. The Mountaineers returned home to play Colorado State, then hit the road again, this time to Boston College. With three out of their first four on the road, many fans were hoping for a split, or at best, three wins. But this club surprised everyone except themselves by winning all four games, including a thrilling 17-13 conquest of the Terrapins. I felt when we left the field and we had defeated Maryland that our football team believed that they were good. I believed that our team believed they could go ahead and beat anybody on our schedule, and they were anxious to get started at the job at hand. There was a new feeling of confidence within the team, and a lot of new faces leading the way. Key injuries forced players like Damon Beasley, Rich Hollins, and freshman King Harvey to shoulder the early season burden. They all came through with flying colors. But no player typified the success of the 1981 Mountaineers more than tight end Mark Rao. A junior from Roaring Spring, Pennsylvania, Rao was back in his home area when West Virginia traveled to Penn State to face the number one ranked Nittany Lions. Rao had been overlooked by Penn State recruiters, so he introduced himself by catching 10 passes, tying West Virginia's all-time record. This outstanding performance came on the heels of games against Pitt and Virginia Tech, which the Mountaineers had split. After seven games, West Virginia was 5-2, and two, and Mark Rowell was well on his way to a West Virginia record for past receptions. Coach Trang, when I sat down at the beginning of the year, and we talked about maybe catching 20 passes. The previous year I had 11, the year before that 12, and we thought if we could catch 20, that would be, you know, a nice goal. And as it worked out, I caught, I caught four, I caught hit five, maybe six in a game at a time. Going into the Penn State game, we found a route that was working, and it was getting like nine or ten yards. It's like a little slip right across the middle. Caught ten of those. And I think after that, we realized that, you know, that was working for us. It kept drives going. It sustained drives. And I think we used that a lot. We used it against Syracuse. We really used it throughout the rest of the year, and I think that's why I caught 61 passes. The first half of the season proved exciting and enjoyable for Mountaineer fans everywhere. There were two losses, but they came to Pitt and Penn State teams that were ranked number one in the nation at the time West Virginia appeared on their schedules. There was also a big homecoming win over Virginia Tech. After seven weeks, WVU was recognized as one of the best teams in the East. All we're trying to do is get better every week. Every goal that we have set, what we want to do as a team is certainly reach it, boy, and we're going to reach it.
And one of the primary reasons West Virginia football was gaining respect was a defense second to none in intensity, strength, and desire. These players were a big hit in more ways than one. No single player dominated the defensive effort, although several earned well-deserved laurels. Linebackers Darrell Talley and Dennis Fultz became an inside-outside combination that made opponents' ground attacks stall at every turn. And when they tried the mouth near middle, a powerful trio was waiting to strike. At tackles were Calvin Turner and Todd Campbell. The middle guard was Dave O'Black, who battled back from a serious knee injury in 1980 to start again in 81. How good were they? Just ask defensive coordinator Dennis Brown. I think the secret to our success defensively this year was a number of things. I think number one was the emergence of a bona fide middle guard. It was the emergence of uh, a dominant tackle. And it was the emergence of a defense that totally was committed to playing well. Mountaineer opponents were forced to gain 179 yards and run almost 50 plays before this defense would allow a touchdown. Those statistics explain why two opponents never crossed the goal line. East Carolina and Rutgers were held to a field goal apiece. West Virginia's secondary was a primary reason the offense had the ball so much. Interceptions became almost routine as every position in the backfield picked off at least two passes. Finally got into the act too. Jeff Seals even scored against Boston College when he picked off a pass and found 41 wide open yards between him and the goal line. Several members of this memorable unit earned postseason honors. Gerald Talley was named third team All-America and Todd Campbell honorable mention as was Lynn Murray. Dennis Folks joined them on the All-East team as did Seals. They all left their marks in opponent's backfield. If West Virginia's defense was superb, its offense was simply sensational. Moving the ball was not just a strength, it was an explosive attack that averaged almost five yards of play. Only twice in 12 games did WVU fail to score at least 14 points, and both occasions came against teams that were ranked number one in the nation. Just look at these final scores. The ground attack was Thurlin Beck, who picked up 460 yards and scored twice. Dane the Train Conwell bruised his way to 340 yards, most coming straight up the middle in pile-driving fashion. But the man who became Mr. Versatile for this Mountaineer offense was junior Mickey Walzak. After recovering from some nagging early season injuries, Walzak finished third in rushing with 239 yards and second to Rao in receiving with 41 catches. Only Rich Holland scored as many touchdowns as Mickey hit pay dirt six times. He even completed a pass, and of course, it was good for a touchdown, too. And Damon Beasley, who came to fall practice as the fifth team fullback, provided the depth and drive needed to keep the ground game going. Beasley picked up over five yards every time he touched the ball. But frankly, he didn't touch it very often. None of the West Virginia runners did. But with luck on our side, that was to be expected. Not the kind of luck that comes from four-leaf clovers and other charm. 
but rather the kind of special advantage WVU got from the greatest quarterback in the history of West Virginia football. Oliver Luck now holds every career record he could possibly reach as a West Virginia quarterback. He started for three seasons and will be remembered for years to come. Ollie's career totals are WVU records that surpass marks set by such all-time Mountaineer greats as Bernie Gallipa, Mike Sherwood, and Dan Kendra. He picked up well over 6,000 yards in total offense with over 90% coming through the air. His final regular season game at Syracuse may have been his greatest performance ever, even though the team was upset in the final second. Luck completed 34 passes for an all-time record and connected on 12 in a row, another WBU mark. The performance was instrumental in breaking another school record, with Mickey Walczak snaring 12 of those passes to break the former single-game mark of 10 co-held by Oscar Patrick and Mark Rowe. Even so, Luck's football heroics were overshadowed by other more important achievements. He was named first team academic All-America twice and advanced to the regional finals in his pursuit of a Rhodes Scholarship. Others recognized him for his unique combination of athletics and academics. The NCAA selected him as a member of its today's top five, one of that organization's highest honors. The National Football Foundation tabbed him as its keynote speaker among the 11 scholar athletes honored in New York. Luck has definitely made a mark that will last a long time in West Virginia sports annals. When I came here to school, I uh, really didn't set any lofty goals and didn't uh, write down on a, on a sheet of paper what I wanted to accomplish. But I had uh, some ideas in the back of my mind, some goals that I did set. And uh, I tell you, my experiences here as a football player and as a student far exceeded all my expectations. And... Uh, I'm very grateful to the university and to the entire state for making my stay in Morgantown for four years uh, so pleasant. But what had to be Luck's proudest moments came on the soggy, slippery grass of Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta. It was on that turf and that arena against a Florida team that was heavily favored that Luck propelled West Virginia to what some observers have called the most important victory ever in a football tradition that has included 842 games. It's one of the things that was our big goal, get to a bowl game. Uh, the Michigans, the Ohio States, the Alabamas, they all go to a bowl game. We want to put our little name right there. We want to go to a bowl game every year. From the outset, the mismatch everyone had anticipated was evident, but miraculously, the roles had been reversed. Florida was favored. Some odds makers had called the Gators the lock of the year. As it turned out, the Mountaineers held the key to victory. The win by a score of 26 to 6 was even more lopsided than the 20-point final margin. The Gators were not only held in check, they lost yardage on the ground. West Virginia's defense was awesome, allowing Florida quarterback Wayne Peace to complete only six passes for 47 yards. The defensive player of the game was Mountaineer Donnie Stemple. A senior from Vienna, who was the fifth back in West Virginia's nickel defense, spent a lot of time in the Gator backfield and forced the kind of hurried moves that caused turnovers and mistakes. On the other side of the ball, Luck and company were stellar. Ollie completed 14 of 23 passes for 107 yards and a touchdown. Walzak turned in one of his finest days ever, picking up 35 yards on the ground, grabbing eight passes for 75 yards and a score. He was rewarded with selection as offensive player of the game. But the name that will go down in the Peach Bowl record book is that of place kicker Paul Woodside. He began the season as a walk-on and finished as the holder of two Peach Bowl records. His four field goals established a new mark for the postseason classic, as did one kick that carried 49 yards. 
A stunning victory vaulted West Virginia football into the national limelight as the Mountaineers finished among the nation's top 20 in both wire service polls. We are working a lot harder in the weight room. The guys are getting a lot stronger, a lot bigger, a lot faster. Our guys are out, our special guys are out throwing the ball, catching the ball, and it just seems it's a lot different. Everybody's got a different attitude because we are in the top 20. There's going to be a lot of eyes on us next year. We're going to have to prove to everybody in the country that we did belong there and we do deserve to be there. Adding to the growing excitement in Morgantown is the fact that most of this team returns in pack for 1982. Rowell is back. Walzak is back. Tally is back. And Folks is back. Where does it go from here? The possibilities are endless. There's only one thing certain. When it comes to Mountaineer football, the winning is just beginning in Morgantown.